Stellaris. This is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Bureaucrats, miners, farmers, clerks. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. Enslave. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. Slavery. How can we use it most effectively, and how can we use it to maximize our population growth, resources, and empire in general? Let's dive in and take a look. In this video, I'm going to be showing off three slave empire builds. The first one is definitely my favorite and, in my opinion, the most powerful. The second is a build which is used regularly in the multiplayer meta. It is an aggressive build that focuses on early conquest around 2030. And finally, I'm going to show off what is arguably the most powerful build, which is a necrophage build at the very end. Here is the build. And what do we have? We have technocracy. Well, that's going to give us a science director instead of an administrator on our capital, pushing up our science. And then on top of that, all of our researchers will be producing one unity. In addition, we'll have meritocracy, which we can only take due to our oligarchic nature. And we are going to get plus 10% specialist pop resource output from this, which is going to improve our researchers, our ally producers, our consumer goods producers, all of that. Next, we're going to take Fanatic Materialist, which will boost our research speed and also give us access to Technocracy. And finally, we'll have Authoritarian, which will give us access to both Stratified Economy and the ability to enslave aliens and enslave species in general. In addition, that is also going to give us a little 5% boost to output. Then, in terms of our species, we'll have our primary species here. Let's jump into the traits for that. So, Intelligent, that's going to boost our research output. Traditional, that's also going to boost our unity output. So we're going to be producing more research and more unity from our researchers. Due to technocracy, they're also making unity. And then we'll have pop growth speed, just for a little bit of extra population growth. Specifically in the early game, we'll probably edit that out later on. And we'll have unruly, for plus 10% Empire Sprawl because that's kind of a free one and Solitary Pop Housing Usage plus 10%. That's also something of a free Civic at the moment as you'll be maximizing your housing or at least having very large levels of housing to get planetary capacity up in order to maximize your population growth. So this Solitary won't really have an impact. But then as you might have noticed, we have a Syncretic Species. So let's take a look at our Syncretic Species. So. The importantly, and some, somewhat most important, we're going to have this Serviles. That's going to give us an extra 10% from all jobs. In addition, we're also going to have Ingenious for an extra 15% energy credits, Rapid Breeders for the same reason as before for increased growth, and then Unruly and Solitary, which will be there for the same reasons again. This Servile race is going to be producing an extra 25% energy, plus 10% once we enslave them, so 35% energy straight off the bat, as well as 20% 20, 20 of other resources. And part of the reason we're going to use Stratified Economy is that for some part, portions of the game, we will have individual members of our prime species in worker roles. As well as that, we're going to have reduced happiness from having all these slaves around. Stratified Economy is going to allow us to boost our ruler jobs happiness by an extra 5% as well as reducing the consumer goods usage of our workers if they happen to fall into that category. On top of that, we need to be able to enslave our syncretic race right from the start to get an extra 10% bonus to our resources from the get-go. One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to change our servile species, we'll change their rights to slaves from full citizenship, which is where they start. Then the slavery type will be chattel slavery. That'll give us an extra 10% bonus to resources. So if we go and have a look at one of our slaves now, let's take a look at one of these technicians. We can see that a single technician is right out of the gate producing nine energy. We're getting bonuses 10% from serviles, 10% from slavery, 5% from our empire because we are an authoritarian empire as well as some bonuses from the stability and ingenious which we've taken just to improve our resource output of these technician jobs. And then on the flip side of that, we have 
our specialist pops, so to speak, our primary species, and they're getting bonuses for traditional, for intelligent. Uh, they're getting you know, qu quite a few bonuses here. At the moment, it lo it's looking like we're producing an extra roughly 30 to 35% uh, science and unity, as well as producing extra alloys. Again, they're roughly around, uh, that's around 40% extra. Now, generally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building up our capital world here adding uh, lots of research buildings to the capital, which will cost us quite a few consumer goods. But to offset that, we're going to be taking our new worlds and we're going to be filling them up with generator districts and our slave race. And then we'll specialize them, put the special buildings on. So here we are in year seven, we've grabbed a couple of planets. Now let's go in and take a look. So we have our technicians here, which are the uh, secondary species. And they're producing slightly more energy now. That'll be uh, partly down to the fact that we've specified this world as a generator world. And we're just going to keep trying to push that up to increase our energy production, which we'll then be using to buy all the consumer goods we need, to buy extra alloys, and uh, and really we'll be riding on the backs of these servile slaves with, with a big whole stack of bonuses far into the future. Here we are even further into the game now. This is a 2236. And now we can see that a single technician is producing around 20 energy, which is, is, is really good. You know, with 35 years into the game and we are pumping out energy, we're getting 115% partly. So that's 50% from the edict, uh, the capacity subsidies, as well as uh, we've taken some of those plus 20% technologies. We've got the serviles, as you can see there, the ingenious, the slavery stability on their planets, making it even better, as well as the generator world specialty. And then the fact that we have a, an energy grid, which is increasing the base uh, energy production of these jobs. I haven't actually managed to roll the technology in this particular save for the upgraded version. Now, something we're going to be trying to get as the game goes on is thrall world technology. How are we going to do that? Well, first and most importantly, we're going to sift through the scientists until we get one of these scientists with the statecraft expertise. As well as that, we're going to make sure in our society research we take the neural implant technology as soon as we see it. And then we're going to try to take technologies which don't open out into further options. We're going to be tech beelining. Now, there is still some RNG in this. It can still be difficult to get to Thrall World. And if you don't get it, you're going to be, it, it's going to be slightly more difficult. You're, so don't base your entire playthrough on getting Thrall World is what I'm first going to have to say. But once you've got neural implants and with a, uh, a statecraft expertise scientist, you get a one and a half, 1.25 chance increase of getting the technology for Thrall Worlds. So let's take a look at Thrall Worlds and why they really work well with the build. Let's take a look at this thrall world. So we have the mainly, and kind of most importantly, we have this plus 50% modifier, which thrall worlds get to pop growth speed. Basically making thrall worlds as fast as a cuminopolis for your biological pop growth. On top of that, you fill them to the brim with slaves. So they're basically going to have almost no consumer good usage. So here I've got, uh, this is actually quite a small world in terms of the districts available, but uh, I've got 37 pops on, and this planet is completely self-sufficient in terms of its resources. I mean, a small number of consumer goods, but otherwise it's outputting vast amounts of uh, energy and minerals, given that I've only got, uh, I think, what's that, eight miners and eight technicians? Yeah. What you generally, I guess, want to do here is, is find some planets and uh, specialize them as thrall worlds right at the start, after you've got the technology, of course, and then you can fill them up. On top of that, when you take an opposing world, when you conquer a planet, you can strip down the entire planet and enslave the species, turn it into a thrall world, and then fill it up with resource produ producing districts. And that way, you're not going to have a happiness issue from these conquered pops. They're immediately going to be producing the right number of resources and you're not going to have any um, really any issues with them. So something else to note about uh, Thrall Worlds is that they have access to slave hut buildings. So you can get the planetary capacity up very quickly. You get access to five building slots at the 
the, the lower level of planetary capital. And once you upgrade it, you get access to all of your building slots. You can put in these slave huts. They give you plus eight housing and only have an upkeep of one energy, which will allow you, even with a very small population size, to get high capacity and get to that maximum pop growth very quickly. Yes, you will not be able to specialize your planet as anything other than a simply a thrall world, so you won't get a bonus to your energy output of 25%, for instance, or your mining output or, or anything like that. But in count counter to that, you are getting this massive 50% bonus to pop growth, which is really important. So this here is an example of a thrall world where I have I've enslaved the uh, I've, I've conquered them, I've enslaved them. They are unhappy, but that really is not affecting their output in any way, shape, or form. These aren't uh, my primary species; they're even weak, but they're still producing 17 energy per pop. So I'm getting this planet here, 56 pops, getting 300 energy, 100 food, and minimal consumer good input. So you can kind of balance your empire with some core worlds with a mixture of slaves and specialists, and then your central capital, which you'll want to make into an Ecumenopolis. What do we kind of counterbalance these thrall worlds with? Well, we counterbalance them here with our Ecumenopolis. So this is our Ecumenopolis, and it is taking in a ferocious number of minerals. Uh, I can see 734 there, as well as some energy and some food. And we have this planet filled up with our primary species in the majority. And let's take a look at this primary species. Well, we've gone down the biological ascension route. And so we have got the increased pop growth speed. So we're going to be getting here with these these guys plus nine pop, nine pop growth points per month. So we're going to be outputting new pops quite rapidly. We're going to be erudite to increase our researchers output, robust just to increase our general resource output, as well as making all of our leaders live for a very long time. And we've got not just one, we're going to have some other Ecumenopoli just so we can get high pop growth across the board. So uh, I guess the general plan here, if you can manage it, is to fill your empire with Ecumenopoli and Thrall Worlds and use these two with the fantastic pop growth you're getting to really storm ahead in terms of the number of pops you have relative to other empires. Now, just a quick word on the biological ascension. Because we've got biological ascension, we can modify our servile pops. And how have we modified them? Well, we've modified them to be nerve stapled and to also be fertile. So they're going to be growing faster, quite a lot faster, uh, as well as having plus 5% resource output from jobs and 10% from serviles. And we'll throw in strong for an extra two and a half. So that's 22 and a half percent extra plus with our energy credits, an extra 15%. And we are going to try across the board to balance our economy with energy so that we are buying lots of things. As you can see here, I'm actually buying in lots of the resources I need and still running quite a high energy surplus. And then quickly looking at the ascension perks I've taken. So I've taken technological ascendancy to start with. That's going to increase the chance of getting rare technologies like the thrall world technology, which is going to be quite important to us. Then I've gone down the engineered, the biological ascension path so that we can upgrade our servile species while still benefiting from that servile trait. In this particular playthrough, I, I didn't find a relic world anywhere. So I went with arcology project number three just to get that Ecumenopolis up and going. Uh, as well as uh, here, as you can see, I've, I've finished off Biological Ascendancy and I've also taken Executive Vigor just so I can have more capacities going. So at the moment I've taken Extended Shifts, Capacity Subsidies, as well as Research Subsidies just for my, uh, my three Capacity Subsidies. Capacity Subsidies is the important edict and the other two are simply uh, I, I wanted to increase my, uh, my worker output and I wanted to increase my research output as well. Now, one of the changes that has been made in this current edition of the game, in 3.0.3, is that forced growth is no longer a 33% reduction to pop growth, but only a 10% reduction to pop growth, which makes it much easier to manage this primary secondary species duality, because on a planet where you want to have just your primary species, you can force them to grow. On, a, on another planet where you want to have more of your slave population, you can force them to grow. Now it is definitely fiddly, but 
overall the bonuses you're going to be getting from your civics and things like that is going to be quite good. As my third civic, I've tended to go with the Memorialist just to push the stability up on my core worlds, on my Akumanopoli, to get that really high to, to push up my pop resource output on those planets. As interestingly, this isn't really a tall build in as much as it's very hard to build tall in Stellaris, but it's definitely a build where you aren't punished as heavily for not managing to go wide. Due to that massive pop growth and all the resource modifiers you're going to be getting, you can survive with fewer planets and still have really good outputs. Here we have another build. This one is a Slaver Guild build. So what's that going to do? First off, we're going to have Slaver Guilds, which is going to increase our pop resource output for enslaved pots by 10%, as well as enslaving 40% of our species. On top of that, we're going to take Meritocracy to increase our specialist output, Authoritarian so we can uh, have the stratified economy living standards, Xenophobe for some extra pop growth, and Spiritualist just to push up some unity production. Then we're going to have Intelligent, Traditional, Rapid Breeders, very similar as before. And the starting one we're going to take is On the Shoulder of Giants. Now that's going to give us a whole wealth of easy to complete archaeological dig sites, which should provide us somewhere in the region of 40 to 60 minor artifacts. And with those, we can use those to kickstart our economy. As well as in the mid game, we're going to get an event chain, which is going to give overall buffs to our empire. Now, this is a faster, more aggressive build than the previous one. But with this build, you can't really make use of Thrall World uh, in the same way because you don't have this secondary species. On top of that, you can't specialize your secondary pops, so you can't have better pop out output from those pops. This is definitely easier to manage. You can change your slaving species to indentured servitude. Let's, let's jump in and have a look. So in order to make this work, we have to set our slavery type to indentured servitude here. And what will that do? Well, first off, that's going to mean that our, our enslaved pops here don't have consumer good usage in the specialist role. So that's going to save us some consumer goods, absolutely. But on the other hand, our pops in these slave roles will not be having the same kind of output from our raw resources as we were getting in the, in the, other, in the other areas. If we just skip ahead for a little bit so we can take a look at our output at the end of the month. Yeah, so this build is going to be able to get there much more aggressively because you can kickstart your economy by completing these dig sites and getting the minor artifacts. And you're going to be looking at, in a multiplayer situation, attacking it around 2030. But in the long run, you can't make use of the uh, of planets in the same way as the other build. From a purely slave perspective, I would say that this is uh, over a long enough period of time, a weaker build as your pops will have per pop lower output. In terms of bonuses, this slaver guild giving a 10% is equivalent to having our, our others as chattel slavery, which means that we actually get this spot completely free, which is where we can put technocracy in, getting really nice bonuses to our unity and science output overall to get much better unity and science production. And here we have the final build. This is a Necrophage build. Now this build is probably, and almost certainly, going to be more powerful than either of the two builds we've looked at before. The reason for that is this Necrophage origin. We're going to be getting uh, between eight and 10 pops on two primitive worlds right adjacent to us right at the start. So we're not going to have to spend all those resources on colony ships. We can simply spend 100 minerals on, a uh, on an army, and then we can land that army on those planets to take them. So that's going to give us, and after 10 years, we're going to switch them over from probably being something like a clerk, because if we make them clerks in the beginning, they're, the problems with stability and happiness on that planet will be completely ignored by the fact that clerks produce trade value and amenities, neither of which are affected by stability because they're not resources. So the first 10 years, we're going to do something like that. We can also have a primary species here, which we've got the necrophages. They're going to get bonuses to ruler and specialist output, reduction in upkeep, massive lifespan increases, as well as the bonuses we saw before. Intelligent, traditional, because we don't need rapid breeders, I've thrown in charismatic, but overall quite a strong species. And then a secondary species. Now we don't have serviles here, so we're not going to be getting that nice juicy 10% bonus, 
but otherwise I put in strong instead for two and a half. So it's seven and a half percent weaker. When we start this up, we can still enslave them straight away because we've gone for a authoritarian fanatic materialist. We've gone meritocracy technocracy, just like that first build. And this is going to give us big bonuses to our specialists, bonuses to our resource output in general. And we're going to enslave probably any species that we come across and in certain cases possibly purge them to turn them into our primary species. In most multiplayer settings, you're not allowed to use the Necrophage Origin. It's banned because it is so powerful. But I just wanted to briefly show off um, what is probably one of the most powerful slaving builds, which is this Necrophage Meritocracy Technocracy. And there you have it, three powerful slaver builds, each one with a different specialty. The first, more of a slow burner that's going to turn into a massive economic powerhouse in the mid to late game. The second being a more of an aggressive rush build where you're going to try and conquer neighbors to get your economy going in the mid to late game. And the third being necrophages, which are simply very, very powerful. If you have any thoughts on these builds, please leave a comment down below. Uh, I'd love to talk about them and I'm sure, you know, I might have missed certain things overall that could have improved these builds slightly as well. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please leave a like. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. In addition, if you'd like to support my channel, there's a link to Patreon down in the description.